Greetings, Earthlings. Planet Mitch from Planet5D.com, and we're going to discuss the brand new camera that was announced by Canon just a few minutes ago. The 1DX Mark II has just been announced by Canon. It's going to be available shortly. They didn't specify in the announcement uh, when the actual release date is, but it's going to be $5,999, and we're going to talk about that with my very good friend, Barry Anderson who is the author of this book, The DSLR Filmmaker's Handbook. I'm currently holding up the first edition because he hasn't sent me a new one yet. But you get the second edition if you go to planet5d.com slash Barry, that's B-A-R-R-Y. You can get that on Amazon. I highly advise you to check that out if you're doing any filmmaking with DSLRs or any filmmaking at all. Welcome, Barry. Hello, Mitch. I'm, I'm pleased that you are up later than your normal self, so I'm hoping that... Uh... So going over some of this is going to help someone who also is excited and uh, out surfing the web here tonight. But I would, I'd like to clear up one misnomer. Um, it's not five thousand nine hundred ninety-nine dollars. It's six grand, and we'll just you know we don't need to go through all the extra little lines. Everybody sees that and they go it's six grand. Yes, I know. So I'm going to talk about two different kinds uh, top side topics, two different topics of this camera the photography side and then the video side. We're gonna mainly focus on the video side because if you go look on YouTube, even just after the camera is just announced, there's a whole bunch of photographers that Canon has shown the camera to and they're all talking about the great photography stuff. But Barry and I wanna spend a lot of time talking about the video side. But first, let's go quickly through some of the photography aspects. And I'm gonna show the Planet 5D uh, blog post that we've just made uh, for the 1DX Mark II, and you can see some of the features. The exciting bits here, and I'm probably scrolling a little too fast, the exciting bits for photographers, uh, the dual pixel CMOS autofocus, uh, we're going to talk about that a lot in the video side. ISO 409,600 is the highest ISO for the photo side. Uh, which is one stop higher than the original 1DX. They've put two brand new Digix 6 Plus processors in this. Uh, we're going to talk about the 4K in just a minute. Um, the 14 frames per second uh, is what's really got a lot of photographers excited. If you look at the blog post further down, and I'm not going to scroll all the way, there's a couple of videos showing you how fast 14 frames per second is in raw mode. But I wanted to point out that I've noted that uh, you don't, uh, let me say this in two phrases, they are also talking about 16 frames per second uh, in mirror lockup mode or live view mode, uh, but that only comes in with locked autofocus and locked auto exposure. Uh, you can in the 14 frames per second, which I mean, we're talking about two frames per second, so it's like crazy. Why do you have to have 16? Uh, but with the 14 frames per second, you have full control over auto exposure and uh, locking the exposure. You don't have to lock the exposure. I'm stumbling a lot. It's late at night. I'm sorry. The ability to capture 170 raw images in one burst is insane compared to the old cameras. This is a 20.2 megapixel full frame sensor. They have a lot more cross point types in the autofocus system, uh, accurate tracking of subjects in stills and video, which I think is gonna be really fascinating to test out when we get to the video side. Uh, they do have an 8K, I'm sorry, eight megapixel frame grab well, uh, reviewing the 4K video. I think it says shooting 4K video, but in all the examples I've seen, you can only do that while looking at the video in post or in your camera after you've shot it. Does have built-in GPS. There are two card slots. One is a traditional compact flash card, and the other is the new CF Fast. Uh, there are also two options when you buy this uh, in that you can get a kit that has the CF Fast card and the CF Fast reader. So that's kind of awesome that you can you can get that upgrade. And that's 62, I'm sorry, 6,300. I was going to say 
6,299, but I knew you'd catch me on that. But so it's $6,300. Um, interestingly enough, you can see the electronic level in the viewfinder, which is a new thing on the 1DX, which has not been on any of the Canon cameras before. The LCD is touch sensitive, uh, and I I made a little comment here in the blog post because Canon has always told me that pros don't like touch LCDs, and here they are putting it on the 1DX Mark II, which is kind of cool. So you can, while you're shooting video, uh, change the focus points by simply touching the LCD. Uh, and the other thing which kind of bothers me is they do have a new battery, uh, which is the LPE19. Uh, but the good news is that you can still use the old batteries in the new 1DX Mark II. So that's kind of cool. So let's talk about video stuff now, Barry. I've talked for a long time about photography. You still there? Right. I'm still here. I'm, I thought you were going to th throw out a, a subject or something, not just kind of drop it there. So I'm, I'm 4K happy. video, all right? So they, interestingly enough, they did not go with UHD, which is a slightly smaller resolution of 4K. They are doing the 4096 by 2160 DCI. They believe that filmmakers will use this camera more than 4K broadcast people, which is why they made that decision. And I would, I would agree with them. This is not a camera that a lot of broadcasters are probably going to work into their pipeline. So standardizing on a traditional 4K video for film makes a lot of sense to me. That's a big hurrah for Canon on that one. I think I think the piece that will probably be overlooked. I have said to many many people because I I started well I started way back when when I was a young lad shooting film, but uh, you know I I used to use DSLRs exclusively. I'm now kind of all over the map in the different cameras that I do use, but I wanted I've been asking for a long time now. When is someone going to come out with a DSLR body that shoots 4K video at 60p? Someone who does that is finally going to actually fit a niche that has been, I think, fairly, fairly well needed uh, out there in the marketplace. I think that's a, a, for me, that's one of those ones that would cause me to actually purchase an upgrade. So to me, this is a pretty big deal. Um, I think uh, this works very well as a camera that can be either an A camera or B camera. And I think it's priced as such. If someone's shooting DSLR, this is a, a great, a great camera because it can not only shoot unbelievable video, it can shoot stills, so you can you know build twice for that. And then if you get on other productions, being able to shoot 60p at 4K, this can be a B or C camera. Um, and you can charge a little bit more because it's a feature set that does not exist. So it has not yet been commoditized. And I keep telling people, if you're gonna buy gear, make sure you can pay for it or make sure you can uh, charge more for it. Uh, and not just be one of the bunch. So there's not there's nobody else out there besides this camera that I'm aware of as a DSLR body, whether mirror or mirrorless, that shoots 60p in right. 4K, even to an external recorder. So I think it's a pretty pretty big upgrade. And there are traditional big boy cameras that are shooting 4K. In Correct. And there are and on the big boy shoots, I just was shooting uh, for ESPN and another 30 for 30. And uh, we had to shoot a bunch of stuff on DSLR because the places we were shooting, um, either it was too distracting to have a big, you know, like a, a F55 or FS7 or even a C100, C300, um, that we just want to tuck these cameras in. But then, you know, they wanted slow motion and, you know, trying to work on a 5D3 uh, and shooting in 30, conforming to 24 to fake slow motion or dropping down to 720, they didn't want to do that. So, you know, we're always looking for workarounds and uh, I don't want to work around. I just want a camera that I can charge for and it works. And this one looks like, even though I think a lot of people probably are going to squawk a little bit about the price, uh, which I think brings up the big debate of when they're going to drop the 5D. Uh, Mark IV? Whatever, I don't know if they're going to call it Mark IV, or if they're going to change it, but the successor to the 5D Mark III, whatever they want to name it to, is what does this leave on the table for them to put in the camera? And is this the sort of thing where kind of when the 5D3 came out, at first I wasn't sure about the feature set and being $1,000 more. I'm like, ah, I don't know. But I've made more money off my 5D Mark III than any other camera I've ever owned. Um, so uh, it's one of those things where up front it might feel like a lot, but depending on 
what you can do with the camera. Um, it, it, this could be, I don't know. I don't know if this will just air more on the kind of pro side, but I think this is a really good swing camera. To me, I can use it as stills. I can use it as a primary DSLR, and it's got enough kind of feature sets that are out there that can work as a B or C camera with bigger cameras. So I feel like this is maybe the most versatile camera on the market today. Um, well, not that it's available right now, but when it right. hits the stands, uh, barring no one beats them to the punch, uh, I, I, I would have to take a very serious look at this camera. Uh, it also shoots uh, 120 frames per second in HD, which has not been on a DSLR before, correct? Correct. And I think with as much as I want 4K, 4K, the clients who want it, they drive price. So I can charge more when I need those feature sets. The rest of the world that, you know, which is still the majority is shooting only in 1080. The ability to go up, you know, to 120 frames is quite large. That's one of the features I think that's been driving the, uh, FS7 and the, the new F, F5 for uh, Sony is that ability to go up to 180 frames. Uh, now, some are going to say, when you look at the FS7, that being, I think it's like eight, nine grand versus, you know, six grand, they're saying, hey, this and that. But I'm like, you know, I remember when people were talking about the difference between the 7D and the original 5D Mark II of being maybe a grand, and people are like, well, I can never afford that. So $2,000, I know in the real world, is a big deal. And I also know that six grand is a big deal. So, you know, there are some people this will just be outside of their 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 budget, but I think looking at the feature set, it, it, it it's it's a viable camera. Yeah, that would be me that can't afford this camera, but uh, I have used the 1D X thanks to B and H photo as a demo. Loved it. Wish I could keep my hands on one of those. Uh, another interesting thing, as a side note, there is a headphone jack on the 1DC Mark. 1D, I'm sorry, I see I already did it. 1DX Mark II, so that that satisfies a lot of needs. But I also note that there is no C log. Now, the 1DC, which was the Cinema EOS DSLR, has C log or Canon log on it. In order to <laughs> Uh, it, so this camera does not appear to have any C log options. How does that impact your selection of this or not? Almost all productions where I'm using a DSLR as the main camera, um, almost none of them are heavily post where they're doing a full color grade and stuff. So generally speaking, I'm doing a modified flat where they can kind of do their normal, let's goose the, goose the saturation, you know, bring down the contrast and maybe, you know, brighten it up a little bit. Um, but by and large, I'm not doing a whole lot of coloring. And since I've gotten really good at exposing and getting things right in camera, uh, I would say that probably for 80, 90% of the productions I'd use this camera on, uh, the Canon log wouldn't be a deal killer. Um, you know, I always want more. We always are going to complain about something. Uh, but to me, to me, I, I it's not a deal killer for me. Yeah, good. But you can post in the comments why you think I'm nuts and why you think it should be there for six grand because everybody out there is going to be like, well, if I'm going to pay six grand, it should have everything. And the answer is no. You just figure out what price point you can buy in, start charging, earn more money, and you can buy a bigger toy next time if, uh, if you do your job well. You're uh, an advocate of the dual... Pixel autofocus, aren't you? I've I've used it on several of the Canon cameras, and I really like it for what I do. But you tend to shoot a lot more real films and commercials. Uh, how do you feel about the dual pixel pixel autofocus? And I am I'm, I'm they're implicating that their improved subject tracking is going to be an even better generation of dual pixel. Uh, not that there's that much online, but the stuff I have seen, the auto, the tracking seems to work extremely well. And I think, uh, you know, there's still something just like a steady cam versus a gimbal. When you actually put an operator doing something, in this case, they're actually pulling focus for you. There's a certain artistry to that that is really nice when I'm doing a film or something like that. So if I'm working on a narrative piece, I might still hire a focus puller, but there's a whole lot of work where anywhere from a one man band to a small crew, you know, if I'm going to fly it on a glide cam or steady cam or gimbal and I'm doing it all by myself, it's really not feasible. I know you can get, uh, you know, thumb controls and you can you kind of doctor this whole thing up. There's a lot of stuff now that just it's fast, 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 fast. 
And so uh, <laughs> the number one thing that we all have heart attacks with is, oh, we'll just do a DSLR. It's going to be a really easy shoot. And like, yeah, we're going to shoot it wide open. So you got a 1-4 and we want to throw it on this and we want you to walk that way and we want the subject to walk in there. Oh, yeah, nobody can pull focus for you. And you're pretty much like, well, good. Well, I'm glad that I can just put the lens cap on and record because it's the equivalent of what I'm going to give you. So Canon's basically stepping in and help fostering uh, the clients that hire us being still completely out of their nuts in terms of figuring out what can we or can't we do with the camera. But I think the, the auto tracking, the autofocus, it allows us to get shots that we weren't able to get and be usable. So I think as a creative person, that's a nice feature. Um, I just have a little bit of a anxiety over every time we keep making it possible for the clients to ask for more. Um, it's always a scary thing. Of course. I wanted to ask you also, this is also shooting motion JPEG like the 1DC does mm -hmm. for the 4K video. Is is that a problem for you, or would you prefer it to be a different codec? Uh, I mean, it's like anything. I mean, there's pros and cons to all of it, but what I'm asking for is the feature set. And on this level, at this price point of a camera, you're not going to get everything, the bit rates, you know, the compression, the codecs that you ideally want. I, I think it's fine. I don't think it's a deal killer. Again, I am I know what I'm buying into at this price point, and it's going to work just fine. The 1DC provided fantastic images, and it worked fantastic, so I don't see this being a problem. I, and, and that's a good point, because I didn't see anywhere in the spec specifications, man, my tongue doesn't want to work, uh, what the bit rates are, and that's always a hot topic for those pixel peepers out there. Yep, and I just think that if the 1DC was good enough, the chances are when they cram all this in there, we're going to be at that or better with a new feature set. So I I guess I'm not, you know, being the night of when we haven't seen a whole lot out of it, I'm I'm not here to, you know, basically say, well, this is ridiculous, Canon blew it. I think this looks pretty pretty good. So negative things, uh, I put a couple of things on my list. The Wi-Fi, the yep. $6,000 yep. camera, this does not have Wi-Fi. You have to buy a basic little dongle for $599. I'm sorry, $600. Uh, there's nothing that's a small little dongle if you uh, attach three figures to the price of it. So it's an expensive dongle. I, it's, I don't I don't really understand why they didn't put uh, Wi-Fi in this because even the smaller cameras these days have Wi-Fi built in. Uh, it's should, we, not should, we be, should we be controversial? Sure. The reason is is because cameo manufacturers that think that we're going to keep buying things don't realize that within the next five years, this is going to put them out of business. <laughs> uh, that was an iPhone, by the way, or a smartphone. Any smartphone. Yeah. Uh, and, and they're we'll connected and we can share and we can do it all. And the more difficult they make it to get it off this camera and to use these cameras, they will lose money because they will keep driving more and more people to cell phones. Okay. <laughs> yes, I know. I'm just, I'm just really making sure that people love me late at night tonight, apparently, is what I'm going for. <laughs> Uh, other negatives, uh, some people probably expected uh, a cinema DNG format or a RAW format out of this. Does it matter to you? Uh, again, it depends on the project. It does say it gets uncompressed uh, video out of the HDMI, which is great. Right. Uh, but again, they didn't give us a whole lot of specs on that. So I don't expect a $6,000 camera to have RAW. Um, the cinema DNG, again, that would probably go hand in hand in, in foot with the uh, the C log stuff. Um, so I think it's just, you know, again, there are cameras that provide these things that cost more money. We can complain that they're not cheaper, but I, again, you know, I think Canon's putting themselves in a rock and a hard place because I'm not sure what they're going to do with the, uh, the 5Ds now because I don't know how much of this you can take and put it down there, make that cheaper, and still hold this. And if they come out with all specs that are far off from this, I think the jump between you know three thirty five hundred to six grand is going to chase off a lot of people. So I think I think even though they've made a great camera, I think they've. I'm going to be real curious to see what the future holds here in the next month or so, between now and NAB, when I assume that they will announce the uh, successor to the 5D Mark III. 
Well, I've spoken to uh, Craig over at Canon Rumors, and he still swears up and down that the 5D Mark IV, or whatever it's called, is not going to have 4K video on it. So if he if he's correct, uh, and, and I think that makes sense, I think... No, no it doesn't. Well... <laughs> if, it, if it's not internal, but you can get it with an external recorder, that's the minimum. If they come out with a 5D Mark IV that does not have the ability to get 4K off of it, Canon has made a gargantuan blunder and uh it's going to be a major problem for them okay let me let me clarify that what i was trying to say was that i think in canon's mind that makes a lot of sense because it protects the 1dx mark ii and, no. the, 1D and the c100 because this, they put 4k in the 5d mark IV that nobody will buy those other cameras i think that's what they think the 1DC never was a massive seller to the big market. It was always in more niche camera, which is what the 1DX Mark II will be. They need to have a flagship camera that shoots 4K in the low end. They came out with the C100 Mark II, does not have 4K. They are in a world of hurt if they think that, oh, everybody that's been in our ecosystem, let's go ahead and have you spend over two times as much on a camera in order to get 4K, and they're not going to have another rev for two to three years beyond this. Uh, Canon, Canon will officially said, you know, we give up. And I think it's a horrible, horrible move if they do that. Well, we will see that in a couple of weeks or months. Theoretically, I think March is uh, the month that they announced the 5D Mark III. So potentially we, uh, we may see that next month. So we will see if Canon is going to... Uh, be duking it out or if they're just going to become an afterthought of remember when Canon was relevant? We'll see. <laughs> like it's that big of a deal. Yes, and, and I, I will agree with you. We'll see. Uh, oh, is there anything else that you think is missing from this camera that uh, you would have wanted to have? No, well, I, I've been, I mean, when, when did the 5D Mark III come out? In 2012? 2012, yes. It's been four okay. years been four years and you know outside of a few minor things that camera has been pretty doggone great i mean i think people who complain all the time now i don't really know what they're talking about i mean the sony a7s you know two is great uh i mean i just feel like there's so many great cameras out there that it's like i don't know i think i think now we just hear from the whiners so no i mean uh if anything i would have loved this to be the 5d mark IV, um at the 3500 hundred dollar price range i think that would have been gargantuan but that's not the way it is so it if if let's say canon does not add 4k to the 5d mark four four then i believe that for people who have bought into the canon ecosystem and they're in the c300 c500 c100 i think they'll be forced into having this camera be their b or c camera but I think there's going to be a fairly large exodus to people that are going to find, because I mean, you have more affordably, because I think the, what, the Sony A7S II is like 2,500 bucks. It's a full frame camera. It's 4K video. I mean, at some point, and then they have, I don't know. I think there's a lot about, I think Sony makes a very compelling argument on that side, even though there's issues with the Sony cameras. But I, I, I think Canon is in big trouble if they don't. So I think going back to this camera particularly, Nothing jumps out at me. I, th I think the wireless thing is just, frankly, stupid. Dumb. Um, yeah. yeah, there's no, uh, that's just that's just someone who, it's like a greedy car salesman. It's like, ooh, we can hook them up, you know, let's sell them the gas cap. You know, you just throw the gas cap in for crying out loud. You know, one thing that wasn't mentioned that I just thought of is the time lapse. Uh, oh, the in uh, intervalometer if it's in there? Yeah. yeah. Uh, again, know. that would be great if it's in there. Uh... I'm not going to, you know, <laughs> not buy the camera because it doesn't have well, a kilometer. So to me, it's not a. I know, I know it's not a big deal for you, but it certainly was a big selling feature on the Nikon D5 that was just announced a couple of weeks ago. So, yes. Well, if Canon continues to not give things that should be in the camera, it's going to hurt them. So mm -hmm. it would be behoove them to do so. One of the other things that I think you were talking about Sony, the things that's appealing to the Sony line and even the Olympus uh, and potentially any other company that puts it in there is uh, Sony has that five axis uh, stabilization that's built into the camera. So you don't need to pay extra on the lenses to have the stabilization. It's right there on the body. And I think 
uh, Canon's kind of missing out if they don't go in that direction, but I haven't seen any hint that they're going there either. Canon, Canon has been the 800 pound gorilla. And when we went out on tour a couple years ago, I stated in the class that it was either Panasonic or Sony that was going to challenge Canon. And I said, if Canon doesn't update their stuff fast enough that they will lose their position. And I'm not going to say that I'm Nostradamus, but I'm going to say so far, I've been pretty doggone right on that. And, and I, I will classify, clarify, or classify, quantify, that I think they're still kicking butt in terms of the photography side. The video side is where they're lacking in terms of DSLRs. And the, one, or the C100, C300 are awesome cameras, and everybody's buying those. See lots of those in use wherever you go, but uh, for the DSLR line, eh, they're struggling. I just um, think, I think that the future is going to be the fusion market. I think that I've, I'm not a photographer. I never tell anybody I'm a photographer, and I get hired to be a photographer all the time now. It drives me crazy. I'm like, uh, okay, not a photographer, but they're like, you take beautiful pictures. I'm like, yeah, but I'm, that's not my job. I'm um, a cinematographer. Um, but I think what's happening now is tools, in order for me to justify buying something, it needs to work as often as possible. So the idea that just having one tool to do this or just one tool to doing that, I'm now consulting a lot with still photographers that are trying to keep from going out of business that have very long, prosperous careers because they're losing through the agency if they can't do a still and video shoot together, then yeah. they're going to go find someone who can. I think there's a lot of that kind of convergence happening. And I think if Canon continues to keep them separate, it's going to be a problem. I know it's harmful because when you have to develop video and stills in one camera, then maybe technology doesn't move as fast as we want it to. But right now, who's buying the cameras is, you know, those who are professionals that are making money aren't just home consumers. And I doubt that many home consumers, like my sister who loves taking pictures, uh, she would never buy the 1DX Mark II. So it's professionals. And I think you need to have a tool that works in both arenas and not separate them. I think those days are gone. Yeah. I do think it's interesting. Uh, my my sort of take on it is that Sony, like the A7S Mark II, is an awesome filmmaking camera, and the photography side of it isn't quite as robust, where Canon is the opposite, and the photography side of the DSLRs are really kicking ass, and the video is kind of really lagging behind where they were leading the market before. I will so, have to send you a video. I'm sure okay. I can find it somewhere. Uh, our friend Lisa, uh, Lisa Betney, and I'm forgetting uh -huh. her new last name. Um, yeah. I did a little reality show with her back, and I think it was like 2009 out in San Francisco. We did kind of a photography scavenger hunt. Yeah, it was hilarious. I don't know how we ended up with this as as the main camera, but she had a Sony Alpha camera, the predecessor to their current ones. And it was hilarious because she was talking about this camera and she's like, this is like unusable. And it was kind of a joke. And now their cameras are pretty spectacular. But I think because Sony was so dominant in the video market, that's why they're doing so well with the video and they're playing a little bit more catch up with the uh, photography side. But I will find that video and send it to you because uh, watching Lisa try to figure out that Sony Alpha camera and her like, yeah, it's Sony Alpha. It was kind of the butt of the joke, which made the whole piece that much more entertaining. But yeah, I, you know, the Sony Alpha camera line didn't come with a long legacy of like, ooh, these are amazing still cameras. So I think you're right. Hey, for those of you watching, hey, I was right once. Barry says so. Great. Thanks, Barry. Uh, it's time to wrap this sucker up. We didn't tell anybody where they can find you, by the way. I think you do have a website called Barry Anderson with two S's dot com. You got it. You can follow me. I got, I got two things right. Yeah, I'm on Instagram, same thing, Barry Anderson with two S's, O-N, uh, if you want to follow me there. But uh, I appreciate anybody who wants to check this out. If you have questions, leave them in the comments section. We'll respond to them because I'm sure over the next couple of days as people catch up with all this, we'll either send some links or, uh, or updates um, as some of the features or some of these clarifications on specs come out. Uh, and you can all find that at planetfyd.com. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, we are going to have a giveaway if you're watching it, the announcement week next week from Cineo Lighting. So keep an eye on Planet 5D for that or look at planet5d.com slash giveaway. You can always find our latest giveaway if we happen to be giving something away. We're going to have something following up that immediately after. So 
we've got several things in the pipeline to keep an eye on planet 5d this is planet mitch from planet 5d over and out